I'll record onto my computer. <laughs> good. Um, so, um, good afternoon um, again um, to um, everyone that have joined us um, today, all of our friends, wherever you're connecting from. Um, a big good afternoon to you all. Um, thank you for um, registering for this webinar. Um, as some of you, um, you, you're aware of what we do anyway. Um, so we are a cybersecurity training organization and um, once um, in every month, um, we um, organize a um, webinar and that webinar is part of our continuous learning. It's part of continuous learning for, um, you know, our students, it's part of continuous learning for um, anyone, all right, um, that um, wants to, um, you know, take their career to um, the next level all right so this is something that we do quite um often we try to do it again once in every month all right uh, but this time around uh the topic here very very hot topic um is called iot deployment using containerized containerized containerization um at the edge all right my name is wally um Omoleri. my name is wally Omoleri. i am um, a cyber security consultant and also the founder um, of smart learning. Okay, today um, I'm the one hosting this um, uh, meeting and I'll also be facilitating it um, as well. I have with me um, two gentlemen, um, the speakers. Um, the first person is um, Mike Lakoju. Mike, um, just a brief um, um, uh, information about Mike. Mike is um, a highly accomplished, result-oriented um, IT executive with over um, 12 years um, of collective work um, experience in both academia and um, in industry as well. So um, as a mix, so Mike um, tutors in one of the university, um, but he's also come with um, a lot of um, 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 industrial um, experience as well, having worked for so many organizations. Um, he has extensive experience in data-driven strategy, um, data science, um, and data uh, visualization. Um, um, he's also experienced in cybersecurity, um, particularly around um, internet um, of things. So Mike is a bag of experience and um, is going to be showing us a whole lot of um, stuff today. I'm so so honored and also excited to Mike um, to have Mike um, um, in this meeting or you know getting him to agree to um, help us out with um, this webinar. Um, the second person um, is Dr. Um, Akimbi um, Akindoi. Um, Akimbi is an experienced cloud um, architect and a data engineer uh, with over six years. Um, of industrial experience. Um, he had um, had the opportunity to work in the telco. Um, it's also, you know, come, come from academic background as well, as you know, the, um, as the title suggests, um, um, is a consultant um, and he has worked for um, financial um, services. He completed his PhD at the prestigious um, Imperial College London, and he has worked for numerous um, company um, in the UK. I think one of the company that he has worked with in the UK is a, it's one of the you know, biggest financial services um, across the world. So again, um, these individuals, they are bringing on board um, um, just a mix or a blend um, of experience within the academics and also um, um, industrial experience as well. So, and when you have those combinations, you would agree with me that it is good. All right, that's a good combination. So um, you'll be able to learn from both sides um, of the world. All right, um, just um, a bit of information for you. Uh, the meeting, um, like I said, um, is being recorded. Um, the recording will be published or it will be uploaded um, onto our YouTube channel. Um, so it's very easy. If you want to find us, just go to YouTube, type um, Smart Learning UK, um, and um, this recording uh, will be there, maybe latest tomorrow um, evening, and you'll be able to um, watch it um, again um, for as many that are interested. There are also other recordings, uh, sorry, there are also other videos as well um, from, you know, maybe past or previous webinars that we did that um, that you would find very, very um, interesting. Uh, we had, um, we've done some webinars around the IoT 
Um, so again, if you're new to the space, um, maybe you want to um, watch those videos as well, and as that would um, help you. For those that are registered with us, uh, we've already sent you some information. You can also visit the website as well um, to learn more um, about what we do. Um, and if there's anything you're interested in after uh, this webinar, please, by all means, reach, reach out to us. We have um, a lot of courses around IoT um, and also um, containerized solution, particularly uh, with Kubernetes. All right. So thank you um, for listening to me. Um, so without wasting too much time, uh, Mike, if you're ready, um, you already have control, I believe so. Um, so you can, um, if you need me to stop sharing, um, I can do that so that you can um, fire up, you know, um, you know, slide, you know, from your side and we can take it from there. Is that okay, Mike? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Arnie. What would you need me to do now? Yes, you can stop sharing. I'll share from here. All right, thank you. Good stuff. Okay, so thank you, Wally. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for having me here again. Uh, it's a pleasure always. Um, so let's just jump right in. I'll be talking around IoT first, just to give some kind of um, broad introduction to IoT. We'll talk about edge computing, the decentralized approach, uh, benefits of edge computing, and then I will then pass on to B, and then he will talk on uh, how we can use containers to manage the deployment of this solution. Now, it's quite timing um, today where we find ourselves, in the era we find ourselves really with technology. Technology has evolved in such a way that it has become an integral part of our lives. People are now really dependent on various forms of technology um, um, in our daily lives. If you watch the way some of us learned when we were in school, it's different from how we see children today learning. It's so interesting when you see a lot of children interacting with iPads, notebooks, and computers, and remember our chalkboards of those days. So <laughs> when we now begin to talk about IoT, IoT is one of those buzz, buzz words that we, we, we kind of hear today. We, people use it loosely, and um, some people understand it. Some people are not sure what it means. Uh, some people begin to wonder, what's, what's this new acronym we're hearing again? But the truth about it is a lot of people are actually consumers of IoT and um, they don't even know it. So, but what is IoT? So when we talk about the internet of things, that's what we're saying. We're saying the internet of things. We're talking about a broad term that is used to describe devices, sensors, everyday items, which are not ordinarily um, considered to be computers, but which have the internet connectivity and computing capabilities. So these objects have now become embedded with, uh, or products have now become embedded with sensors that make them what we call smart. So when we use the word smart, I think a lot of people can begin to relate to these things. Smart cars, smart TVs, uh, smart hoovers, smart toys, uh, smart fridges, you see? So all of these things are things that clearly are connected to the internet. Yes, like the image we see here on the screen, I'm sure a lot of us can relate to that, even our air conditioning systems. So they, all of these things have sensors. If you have a mobile phone and you are able to consider your mobile phone a smartphone, a phone that has the capabilities of even just adjusting to your, 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 eye, your eyes, obviously has sensors. So if I held my phone straight now and I tilted it to the right and the screen is able to turn, clearly how did the phone know that I just tilted my phone. For you to do that, it's leveraging on sensors embedded within the device to be able to output certain for, uh, data, um, uh, results that other applications can then leverage on to give you that functionality. So it becomes really interesting. You see the application and how we're using it. A lot of people, again, when we start to go into different industry sectors, we, 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 we can then begin to appreciate the impact on how things are actually truly evolving. Again, there's lots of conversations around the amount of devices that will be connected to the internet as of this year. There were projections, I mean, I remember Intel, like the slideshow said that were about 200 billion devices 
will be connected this year. Some said 50 billion, some gave 75. One thing I would agree, the numbers are in the billions. That is, that is completely true. Yes, you see smart shoes today. Smart shoes, yes. Smart, smart sweet uh, wristwatches, clocks. And then if you look at this other information from McKenzie and a few other consulting firms, they try to break down a spectrum of smart stuff. So they begin to talk about the manufacturing sector having about 40.2% of new products that are dependent on the internet of things, or healthcare, 30.3, retail, security, transportation. Everybody today, I mean, we, we clearly know about autonomous vehicles. We know about the Tesla cars and all of those things. So we can see how gradually and slowly we have become truly infused or fused with what most people may refer to as a digital business strategy that has, has created this fusion between your former typical business strategy and your IT strategy to, to give birth to this new digital age that, that has now seen an integration of technology within your normal business operations. But then this creates another opportunity. Yes, with every new change, there is opportunity. But it depends on which side of the table you sit. How do you want to appreciate this? How do you want to see this? Where do you want to find yourself in this? How do you position yourself as an organization? Yes, a lot of people talk about data, talk about big data. And we have a lot of terminologies before I jump into the big data and how IoT is also a rich source of data that we can actually um, leverage on. So there are terms and terminologies that we hear flying around. I think it would be good to just mention a few like embedded systems. When you hear that again, people are referring to this technology that has the ability to sense things, to act based on those information. So sensors, actuators, data, and then a, a whole world of systems that an ecosystem working seamlessly and coherently to be able to achieve certain um, goals for the organization or for the product or for the device. Yes, when you talk about sensor networks, a collection of sensor devices, which are connected through wireless channels, cyber physical systems. Again, we get to hear that a lot, especially through the um, manufacturing space. Um, we hear of real-time systems, we hear of um, pervasive systems, which are focused on anytime, anywhere computing. Now, again, within the industries, especially within the manufacturing space and others alike, you might hear IIoT, Industrial Internet of Things, again, Let's just keep it simple. All of that is referring to IoT. Let's just keep it simple within this, in this talk. So I will just use that as a generic name to kind of summarize all of that into one umbrella, the Internet of Things. But it's good when you hear these technologies, you begin to understand what they are talking about. Now, the other names and concepts, machine to machine communication, a typical example of that would be like your water meter, which is um, basically uh, uh, that monitors how much water you are actually consuming within your house uh, or, or things like um, a network which facilitates end-to-end -end connectivity between one machine and things like your radio access or access network, gateways, back-end servers, different things communicating or a valve, for instance, that is uh, opens and closes based on certain actions. You see, so this is again some of the things that we hear about. Now, let's break it down and let's push it back to the house. Let's come home, yes. Now, when we come up to a smart home, for example, IoT is all around us. We have smart kettles, smart robot vacuum cleaners, Wi-Fi sockets, temperature sensors. I remember when I got one small um, IoT plug. At first, my wife saw it, was like, oh, what's this again? And I smiled, I said, it's a smart plug, and she was like, what do you want to do with that again? I said, okay, no problem. And I installed it, uh, it's connected our table fan to it. And I noticed that more than after a week or two, I noticed she now used to wake up and I used her phone to control the light. She didn't need to stand up to turn on the fan or turn it off. You see, so most of these technologies are being are created to be able to help us have a better life. Okay, now I'm speaking on one side of the coin because again, with, with great responsibilities we hear, come, come you comes with um, a price 
And again, like Wally said, there's always a security element to all of this. But apart from security, there's another key thing that we also have to think about, which is how do you actually deploy most of these technologies? What would be your strategy as an organization now? If I'm wearing the hat of an organization, what would be my strategy in um, deploying all of this technology? What would be my strategy on uh, a big data project that involves the internet of things? How would I go about it? Would you just say my competitors are doing this, therefore I would just run and go ahead and just do this anyhow in more of an ad hoc way, like we've seen based on research, a lot of companies actually do. I saw a report about two, three years back. We talked about how companies, about 300 companies were interviewed and about 55% uh, or so, don't quote me right, um, more of them were off target when it came to their implementation projects. And the others, the remaining half, were either abandoned. Now, what would you say is the problem with this? I, I, I kind of suggest, and this is my own opinion, that a lot of these organizations and individuals approach this in a more ad hoc way, rather than having a proper strategy, thinking of a holistic process and architecture, understand the key components that you would require to successfully deploy this solution or successfully implement um, your Internet of Things solution or your big data. Because again, at the end of the day, one of the rich things that we're getting from all of this information all of these devices is the fact that it has the capability of generating data, data that we can begin to harness, data that we can begin to monitor. Just using an example for the smart kettle you see right there. Imagine a care home where we have that and you have kettles and um, elderly people using that and from the reading in a non-intrusive um, non way, we have that data streaming in and we can tell, okay, at 8.30 or 8 a.m. every day, the, <laughs> the signals we get is that the kettle is being used. If for two days you don't see that happen, perhaps you might want to send a doctor to check on, on, the, on that elderly person, you see? So there are many applications of such technologies. Again, if I come and do some little time travel, we remember within the 1800s, we had a revolution which was more around mechanized, mechanization, water, power, steam, uh, and steam power. In 1900s, we had mass production of assembly lines, electricity. And uh, that was, the, of course, that was the second revolution. I'm talking about industrial revolutions now. And then we had the third, which was in the 2000s, which were more computers, automations. And then the fourth re uh, revolution, which we are in now today, um, we have cyber physical systems. And with all of these cyber physical systems, we begin to appreciate another buzzwords which we hear around called Industry 4.0. Again, for those individuals in the space, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. Uh, for those that don't know yet, perhaps you need to know. And because when we're talking about Industry 4.0, most times people just simply talking about a smart factory, smart fact manufacturing or depending on the sector. Again, this cuts across most of those things we sometimes refer to as um, um, critical infrastructures. They use all of these technologies. But when you're actually looking at a smart factory as an example, factories are looking for more innovative ways to become smart. They're looking for more innovative ways to be able to leverage on this IoT data and then use that to improve their offerings. So I'm part of a project that looks at not just the data generated within the factory. So because most times when we talk about industry 4.0 smart factories, the key focus is more around the manufacturing. And then people begin to focus, okay, predictive maintenance. You're thinking about how you can utilize the um, sensors to understand your production or improve your, your productivity within the factory or the factory shop floor and all of that. But there's also data outside. So this project that I've been working on also looks at that data that is generated outside. And one of the things we'll be looking at is with those manufacturing companies that do offer certain products to their customers that create products, how then can I know how people are using my products without actually being intrusive or being bothersome or I don't want to start making calls. I don't want to start um, creating surveys to be able to, to get that information. 
And one of the best ways to do that is to ask the product directly. Hey, product, how are you being used? So if I understand how the product is being used by embedding IoT on the product, I can begin to allow that data stream in, create a mechanism, again, deployment. I can deploy a solution, okay, on how that data streams in. And when that data then streams in, I can then have a methodology that allows me apply artificial intelligence and machine learning because we're talking about a lot, a lot of data now. You, you can begin to do it with a hand or eyeball. You want to create, use things like unsupervised machine learning to be able to handle this at scale. Again, I'll talk a bit more about um, at, uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence very soon. Okay, now, so all of this, all of this creates opportunities, opportunities for us to begin to um, enjoy some of those sensors, sensors have them create data sets for us. Those data sets help us create the either design suggestions or understand um, what the customers want, allow us to create either new variants of the product or allow us to create or understand segments of, of, of our customer base that wants um, a specific product, you see? So because if you begin to understand that, you or I as a manufacturing organization can begin to create more products that I already know that my people want. And I'll make more profits. Again, it helps me, reduces my R&D cost because again, I reduce the cost of creating large surveys while I can have mechanisms for collecting those insights on the go. And again, because of privacy, again, you want to be able to deploy this in such a way that it's safe and either handle the, the, the processing and the compute at the edge. Again, see how we're driving right from IoT and we're now going into the edge. But again, the slide I have up again just talks a bit more about a typical architecture within a factory. Now, I have used the word factory a lot, but then I also want to find a place for an individual. So you as an individual, with all I'm saying now as a person, you can begin to understand where the world is going with data. You can begin to understand the dependence on the IoT, okay? The televisions we had before started from monochrome or black and white, then color TV. Now, if I wonder why your TV now has cameras, you see, you can see now because that baby monitors, you have cameras, you have sensors, you have, you have so many things, so many products that you use, your Fitbit to count the steps you take in a day, or your smart um, or your canvas that monitors how many, how, how fast you run and stuff like that. Now, but what am I saying? With this technology, with where we are, you as an individual, if you want to position yourself, or you're looking for an area also to begin to develop yourself and build yourself on, that will become obviously relevant in the next couple of years, then clearly this is one of those areas. Understanding this technology, internet of things, understanding how to be data literate, understanding things around uh, deployment of the solutions, or creating architectures or securing this environment becomes critical in the world we're stepping into or the world we have found ourselves today. So again, we can see typically within an, within a, um, an industrial setting, we have the SCADA systems, we have the PLCs, and all of the systems highly dependent on sensors. Yeah, again. So let's take another step back. We think big and we think small. Okay, we, as an example, if I want to help you, if you, want, if you want to help someone, you can either do something really big or that obvious warrants being on media or something, or you can break that help down into smaller bits and help just a thousand people in small bits and then have small impacts, but when collected together, amounts to something big. Okay, I'm just, I just want us to think that way for a minute, and there's a reason why. The reason why is this. Now, with all of these sensors embedded in different places, um, clearly, I've, from what I've said so far, you know that these things are generating data. And when I mean the data, <laughs> I mean sampling rates can differ. You can, I can mean from two heads upwards, two, three heads, I can begin to monitor um, a human step. If I want a more, if I want more granular information in um, the data set, I probably will hype 
um, increase my sampling rates to anything between 50 to 100 hertz and I can begin to understand more and get more granular information within the data. Think about it that if I were to drop this pen, right, and I'm recording my acceleration data, okay, and I have sensors on this device, let's call it a smart pen, and if the pen is falling, if I make the sampling rate faster or like 100, so it just means that it will take more readings in between the fall before it hits the ground. That way I can analyze all of that information before it hits the ground, okay. Now, why I'm going with this is this. If the sampling rate is high, clearly you are creating more data. If you're creating more data, how do you want to process this data? Do you want to push this data to a central location, which we, of course, today we know has things like massive server farms, or would you want to manage your resources, reduce cost, be um, a bit careful with things like security, privacy, and then instead of pushing all of that information to a central location, why not process the information and the data at the edge, at the device level? You see that? So that way, if I do process the information at the edge, I can send an aggregated subset of the result back to the central location, stripping away all of those personally identifiable information that will help me identify the individual. That way, I make it GDPR compliant. I also reduce my compute time. Again, depending on where those assets are or what I'm trying to monitor, they might be in places that are very remote, that have very poor connectivity. So you can begin to see, as I'm speaking, clearly the advantages of deploying solutions at the edge, okay? Now that's where we're going with all of this. So when we talk about edge, we can simply say edge computing is a decentralized computing infrastructure in which computer resources and application services can be distributed along the communication path from the data source to the cloud, okay? So we can see some devices there, some IoT connected devices, gateways, uh, edge nodes, and then pushes information to the cloud. Now, that becomes interesting because when you are thinking about this from an architectural standpoint, either as an individual recommended this for an organization, or you acting as a consultant, or you thinking of how to position yourself, like I said, in this space, or you being the factory, the, the management, people that make those key decisions, you might be thinking about how this can save cost for you. Imagine streaming those large chunks of data to the central location before processing it and then pushing it back to where you need the information or collecting it there, saving costs, right? Processing it at the edge and then just sending it. So this diagram now helps me to describe that. So you imagine that fat red circle there has a central storage processing, can handle all of that. Then the connected devices are the net at the network, but the devices on the edge also can store. They can also store, have some storage, and they can also process the data. You see, they can store the data, you can also process it, and then they're taking a lot of the work off the central um, um, processing um, unit. So this becomes a lot more interesting. This becomes, I mean, your preferred solution, if I may put it that way. It becomes a, a more preferred um, option for you, okay? Now, a bit more on edge computing. What are those sort of things that can be done at the edge? So one, we can pre-process the data, avoid a congested network, okay? We can score and classify visual images or sound to act based on those information, depending on the use case and what we're trying to do. We can execute local business logic, aggregation, filtering, frame filing, uh, frame teaming, uh, single compute, name it. So we can do all of that at the edge. We can inspect comp components at high speed and defect identification. It's critical because some of these devices that have these sensors might be in operation. And when the sensor sends particular information, you would probably want to equip that ecosystem of a product with the ability to act on that information rather than send that information to your central location, process it and send it back 
to be used. You see that? So again, this you be, I'm sure you, we can begin to appreciate the benefits of having all of this and using the cloud. You understand? Using the cloud to be able to manage some of these processes. So this pushes me to what really motivates uh, motivates us to try and begin to think about edge computing. One, low latency. When we talk about low latency, we talk about we bring the computing or processing to the ground where the people are or, uh, or where we can get things done much faster, like the examples I gave. Poor connectivity issues. Again, I've been involved with some of the research um, in so far, and um, one of the things we've had to do, we're thinking about projects that involve deploying some IoT solutions to um, some remote locations in Africa. And some of those locations are places where have poor connectivity. So in our design of the research experiments, we have to begin to consider how we get back that data. How do we push back the information? Again, not only in Africa. Again, I've been involved in another project recently where the location for where this particular customer operates, right? There's absolutely no service there. It's like the edge of somewhere outside Wales. It's quite beautiful, I must say. It's beautiful, but no network. So in the design of the solution that I, we were recommending for them, we had to think about how to build a system that allows us to collect data that still stores the necessary readings, but then when we're done collecting the data, by the time they get, um, we're done with the collection, they come to a, another place where we can then upload the information. Again, these are some of the things you begin to think about when you talk about um, your deployment, best ways, uh, your architecture and all of that. Now, another thing is reduction of the server load. We reduce the server load because we push the compute, the processing and storage not only to the set, set from, not only allowing the central location handle that, but we push that to the edge. You see, so we push that to the edge. So we're definitely reducing the server load. Privacy, privacy is a big issue. It's a very, very huge issue, especially for all of us within the EU region. Do you understand? Now, I'll give another example. I know most people do have iPhones, for instance. Your iPhone, the new ones, have the capability of unlocking your phone based on your face, so facial recognition. Now imagine, where's that data stored? Where should that data be stored? So imagine if you are saying the, the data, your facial, your face, um, your, the, the data containing your face is stored in a central location and you want to use your phone and perhaps where you are, there's no internet. So, and if that were the only way to unlock your phone, so your phone would not, open because you are not within connection. Think about it that way. So clearly, even within most of the technologies we already use today, similar approaches of having some storage processing power pushed to the edge device, to the device, to be able to handle at the edge, is already being in use. Again, privacy, that helps your privacy because then you don't have to, I as an organization, Apple, would not need to, for example, would not need to hold that information, I can allow the individuals create all of that information, store their fingerprints, all of that, and then the, the phone has its own memory, obviously, and they can do that processing to allow the individual either unlock the phone or, or, or process how they want to use it. Now, this pushes me to the area of machine learning and artificial intelligence. We cannot begin to talk about all of this data and shy away from this topic. Now, Again, a lot of us hear these words. Some understand it, some don't understand it, some are afraid of it, some believe it's that, some of this. So let's just keep it simple. When we're talking about machine learning and AI, I would just make it really simple here. We're talking about mostly supervised or unsupervised or reinforcement learning. Okay? Now, the first one, which is supervised, is basically just allowing processing data using data sets that have labels. So you have label on a data set and then you can then use that label to train a model on historical data such that when it sees new data, it can begin to pinpoint certain attributes of the data based on the information it has learned. So you train the model on data 
that has labels. So when you classify or you, you, you classify an information as, hey, this is walking, this is sitting, this is standing. When you feed the, 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 the classifier with that information and it learns that information, when it sees new data, it can then tell, oh, this person is walking, this person is sitting, this person is standing based on that information. Now, there are many algorithms that do this and the performance vary from, from, from case to case and there are a lot more things to consider. But keeping it simple, that's it. For unsupervised machine learning, you have no labels. So you have a data set, you have no labels. Take for instance, like the case study I was talking about that I have worked on. If I wanted to understand how people use something at home, for instance, I can use an unsupervised machine learning method collecting sensor data to cluster the information. The clusters will cluster information that are similar. So when I see cluster A or cluster 1, I see cluster 2, I see cluster 3, I can tell, okay, these are three distinct clusters. I would have to then do, go a step further to now begin to understand and interpret what cluster one means, what cluster two, cluster three means. However, I have those clusters. Let me give another example. Imagine you shop a lot and you use, you go to a place like um, Westfield. Westfield is really big in London. So they have many stores. And let's say we have the Westfield card, right? We have a card and let's say Westfield has a card. So a shopping card. So each time you go to any of the stores, either eateries or uh, clothing stores, you swipe, you get some points. So over time, let's say Westfield now wants to do some analysis on segments of people with that had, have used their cards. Now, they might want to do an advert campaign and they would now classify all of those, cluster those information, analyze the information to see how people relate to different segments. So we can see maybe people that are high spenders and also earn more, or people that spend less, earn more or earn less, or people that earn little but are high spenders. You, you can begin to understand those patterns. And when you see those information based on the features you have, again, this is dependent on the data set, you see, and it's dependent on what you feed into the information. But when you begin to understand that, you can then say, oh, this category of people are people that earn much and spend much. So perhaps we might want to target them for our campaign. So you may not know them, but based on the data, you have used an unsupervised method to understand these people. There's also reinforcement learning, which I would just pre prefer to say it looks at basically learning from mistakes. This is being used today, I know a lot more in things like the autonomous learning or some gaming, uh, some gaming um, scenarios where you, you train uh, the model to be able to, or the agent to be able to make some mistakes and you can give it some penalties for that. And then it learns from that and then improves and improves. But the two main really used out there today, really used and it's really common, is more of the supervised and the unsupervised, okay? Now, this becomes necessary because when we're getting all of that data, and I talked about the facial recognition, I talked about sensors, in even like in a jet engine, you imagine the, the, the plane is out there on the sky and then the sensors are picking certain information. You don't want the sensors to now start sending the data to the remote location down here on the airport. You want the plane itself or the pilot there to make certain decisions uh, based on the data or you also have that machine to machine communication that based on that information that the sensors are picking, then there will now be a result and effect that some other sensors then kick in or some other mechanism around the ecosystem kicks in and then so having all of these things at the edge becomes a critical part now i had one or two examples i also wanted to show okay now imagine we have this bridge okay imagine this bridge now i'm going to show the video shortly imagine we have this beautiful bridge somewhere in wales and we as the authority the government, we want to do some predictive maintenance on this bridge, but we want to do this maintenance based on information that we get. We want to have an understanding of how people use the bridge. Who uses this bridge? What kind, do people ride bikes on the, over the bridge? Do people have pets like elephants that cross the bridge? Or do people have donkeys or horses that cross the bridge? Or is it just dogs or maybe a small sheep or a lamb? Do you understand? So has the government, has the authority 
they want to be able to do predictive maintenance on the ship. What would be a very good way to do this? Now, yes, you might say, oh, they can have cameras. Okay, yes. If they plant cameras there, would they just have the cameras there and they have to watch hours and hours of footages to be able to decide? Or can they then create a mechanism with smart devices that have the functionality using computer vision, for example, to be able to identify objects that cross the bridge? Now, let me play this video and then we'll take it from there. So I took this video, I made this video, of course, and then I used an SSD model in computer vision to be able to just identify objects, to identify objects on the bridge. So if I'm identifying all of this, and imagine that we deployed very smart cameras that we push the algorithms to the edge there, we would not need to send large volumes of this data across to the council to process, but we can begin to understand the objects identified that use this bridge. Based on that, we can then plan our maintenance either within the next six months. Again, computer vision is a new area. Again, this algorithm was already a pre-trained model. As you can see, it identified these other bikes that look like motorbikes as motorbikes, so clearly, the model also still needs improvement. This is a second example of another video. Let's say where um, people like um, Asda or Tesco's, I want to make use, better use of our car parks. And then I just, of course, drove around one and just try to create this. Again, I'm able to identify the kind of things, the kind of people, things that are happening around the car parks with this whole Corona thing. They might decide, oh, maybe they want to have food stands outside based on that they notice that small clusters of people actually stop to have conversations outside and it can be another method for generating revenue for um for the asdas or the tescos now all of that information can be processed at the edge right we will not want to now start we will not want to start um creating um pushing all of that loads of data all the way to the central location now finally this is my last slide but before i go just still speaking about that, more talking about the state of the art. We have technologies like this board is an open CV board. Uh, if a colleague of mine uh, were looking at this board and he's already placed on pre-orders because it's really exciting. The board already comes with its own camera and it has an open CV. Uh, you are able to deploy your models directly to it. It comes pre-built with models. So imagine, again, given scenarios. Let's say, with this one on top here, you're able to detect if this is a school, imagine a school environment, okay? A school environment, you would want to identify if some pedophile, for instance, is stalking your school environment, trying to mark a student. So with the camera equipped with this sensor, with, with, with the capability to process data, it can detect that, hey, this guy with this mask has passed the front of this gate in the last 30 minutes four times. This lady is new. This person is two times. You see, again, there are privacy concerns around all of this that needs to be considered. However, there's the technology and there are use cases where this becomes really relevant. So again, like I said, with great, with great technologies come great responsibilities on usage, but the use cases are numerous. With autonomous vehicles, we're checking whether people are waking, wearing masks or whether people are keeping two meters apart. You have the technologies that can show you that. So equipping, your devices or deploying solutions that has this that would have all of this functionality becomes key today now i will pass on this thing leads us actually to another critical part so how then do we deploy how then can we benefit from deploying all of this iot at the edge using containers but remember what are some of those benefits like i said there are use cases in agriculture use case in driverless cars use cases that are, are clearly um, very very key for us today. So now we're going to talk about how we deploy these IoTs at the devices at the edge. And I'm going to pass on to B. But before I do, remember, what are some of those key benefits? Low latency, poor connectivity issues, reducing server loads, privacy. So now when you begin to have those at your fingertips, then you will now want to, of course, be looking for optimal ways of deploying these technologies and containers happens to be it. B, over to you. Thank you.
Right. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mike. Uh, All that right. Was- um, be, before, you, uh, before you kick off, uh, Mike has stopped sharing. Um, uh, Dr. Mike, thank you so much. That was very, very insightful. Um, there's a whole lot of questions um, already uh, popping up uh, with people that wanted to know more how uh, we can use IoT in agriculture, you know, just name it on how we can use this, you know, to better life, you know, quite in, in, you know, insightful there. Thank you so much. Um, I know BE cannot wait, you know, to show us how, you know, the container right solution will now help further uh, with the hedge, you know, that you described. So thank you. Um, guys, just also to let you know um, that this section is being recorded. Um, uh, for those that joined, um, you know, um, us earlier, um, I mentioned it that uh, the, sec- uh, the, the recording is going to be available on our YouTube channel. Um, so what that simply means is, you know, just go to YouTube um, and search for Smart Learning UK, all in one word, and you'll be able to see the recording or watch it as at when you, uh, when you want it, um, as at when you want to see it. The recording is going to be available maybe later tonight or at least in a, a before close of business tomorrow. Um, well, tomorrow is on Sunday, uh, but I would have the recording um, there. Um, um, I would also advise you, um, use the chat box. Um, to um, for your questions, keep populating those chat box. Um, at the end of this meeting, um, uh, the speakers, myself, um, BE, and also Dr. Mike, uh, they will be able to take all the questions um, that you have. A few questions has already been popping as well. Somebody said, "Oh, how can I learn all of this?" Uh, don't forget, you know, uh, we're not just only a training organization. Uh, we're here to impact knowledge. Um, so if, you know, you feel that, oh, this is good for me and that's the direction I want to go, we have a lot around IoT and also Kubernetes as well. And these gentlemen that I have here, you know, uh, they are experts in this field um, and they are also the trainers as well. All right. Um, so, um, Dr. B, are you ready? Yes. Um, Absolutely. I'm... I know you are excited. All right. Good. Okay. Um, so you can fire your slide and um, let, let's take it from there. So, yeah, I'm sharing my screen already. Uh, um, I'm sure you guys can see it. Um, we can only just see um, double click to enter full screen. It says double click to enter full screen. We don't, we're not sure what that is. Double click. It says double share. click to enter screen. screen. Yeah, we, yeah. Can, I, we can see you. Uh, we can see you as, I mean, your your image, but we can't see your your slide yet. I'll try and share again. What about um, it? It still says double, double click to enter full screen mode. I believe that's every, what everybody, Mike, is that what you can see? Uh, on my side, it's saying uh, Akimbi has started sharing, but it hasn't blown up fully yet. Yeah. Yeah, it says Akimbi has started sharing double click to enter full screen oh, mode. Let me, let me try and do something here. It's in my school. Is it better now? No. Um, no, it's not. Mike, no. any idea to... Do you want me to share for you then you tell me when to switch slides for you? Yeah, I think that's, that's probably what I'm going to do. Okay. So not to waste time. Okay. All right. Go, go for it, please. All right. Mike, okay, if you, if you fire it, that would be great. Thank you, guys. So I, what I just do in the background is um, I will start to look up all of those questions and you know, collect them, you know, so that you know at the end of your presentation, uh, be then you know uh, we can start to um, you know um, help answer those questions as much as possible. All right, right I think your slide is up. Um, thank yeah. you, um, Dr. Mike. All right. Be all right. over here. Yeah, next slide, please. So, yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Mike, for the intro. Uh, that was really, really uh, detailed explanation of what we're trying to achieve today. And it's all about edge computing and how we invest the uh, potential of edge computing. So, I'll briefly go over what uh, Dr. Mike has described, just briefly, just to reinforce the point uh, we're trying to pass across here. So, um, the whole idea is we're moving from from cloud to edge okay so what's edge computing so edge computing is you know is, is is a computing that is done near the source of data okay so instead of us relying on you know this distance 
um, data centers in the cloud. Uh, we want to bring that closer to the user. We want to do the processing uh, closer to the user. Th does that mean the cloud is disappearing? Absolutely not. That doesn't mean the cloud is disappearing. All it just means is that we are bringing the cloud closer to the user. Okay? So these are the advantages that this brings to us, right? Low latency. So, you know, you develop this solution close to the user, that's definitely a good thing because you can easily, you know, have access to the data, upload data seamlessly, faster, okay? And we can process massive amount of data and that's where IoT comes into place because IoT generates this volume of, of data and we don't need to do all this uh, migration to the cloud, which is quite expensive because you're using, you know, a, a large tunnel via the internet, that's expensive. But if you can process data as close as possible to you within the device, that's fantastic. Privacy and you know security. Uh, Dr. Mike has done really jo good justice to that. You know we can strip this data, we can remove the PI data, and do the processing on on the edge. And that actually is in a very secure in a secure manner. Uh, local autonomy. That I can't I can't emphasize that enough. So you you have this uh, idea that you know you have your device where you don't have internet connection, you can still use your device. Meaning, once, even when the device is disconnected from the internet, you can still use your device, <clears throat> which is absolutely phenomenal. So you can do offline processing of data. For instance, if you have your iPhone, you can use your iPhone anywhere. You, you can still have your facial recognition working anywhere. You don't need internet for it. That's what exactly you're talking about here. Next slide. <clears throat> So our view, so what's our view um, around this? So what, what are we thinking? What was the thought process around this? We're saying, okay, we are moving. <clears throat> Edge is an extension of the cloud. That's, you need to understand that. Mm -hmm. So don't go around saying we are removing cloud and we are putting everything on the edge. No. So Edge itself is an extension of the cloud. Okay. So our application and, you know, function are still scheduled in the cloud, but they are moved for processing at the edge. Okay, resources device that deploy at the edge are managed, you know, centrally at the cloud. Okay, so it's a, it's a bi-directional communication. Okay, so you have your private network all still behind your firewall, and everything still you know revolve around this heterogeneous uh, node because you know <clears throat> devices are from different manufacturers. Yeah, so when you're talking about you know um, uh, these IoT devices, they're tons of manufacturers, we have Huawei, we have Samsung, we have I, you know, Apple, all, you know, producing devices. How do you, you know, have this synergy, a standard around communication between all these devices? Those are what we are thinking around. And how much of this data can we move to the edge? Hmm? What's the quantity of data we can process at the edge? So we have a limited resources there. How do we tackle that? <clears throat> So edge to cloud synergy, okay? So I've talked about the, the autonomy. You know, you can localize your processing. We have fast reaction to, to all this data and reliability is higher when you are closer to your device, okay? So we remove all those, every processing from the cloud and move to the edge. That's, you need to, you know, have the synergy between those two. And the bi-directional communication has to be very effective. <clears throat> Next slide. So yeah. I'll be talking about the uh, Kubernetes architecture. So Kubernetes, uh, I'll give a, a background of Kubernetes. What's Kubernetes? So uh, Kubernetes started around five, six years ago. And this whole idea of Kubernetes is to help um, have this possibility using containers, using dockers, rather than use your virtual machine. So you strip out the operating system and you have this lightweight um, containers that help you run your application in an automated, fast, reliable, and secure manner. Okay, that's just a, a, a background of um, Kubernetes. We can go, you know, all day long talking about Kubernetes, but that's not the idea here. We are using, we are trying to use Kubernetes to solve the problem at the edge. And that's what we are here for, okay? So what are the benefits of using, you know, um, a containerized application at the edge? <clears throat> so you build once and you can run it anywhere, okay? And it's, it's quite li very lightweight because you've stripped out the operating system. It's, it, it's independent on the um, operating system of the host, okay? So it makes it very lightweight and you can easily move them across different platforms, okay? General application abstraction, you know, uh, it's already becoming a standard in the industry uh, for abstracting application. Very, very good option, okay? 
same experience across cloud and all the edges because it's a standard okay and it's extendable architecture so you can easily we can easily extend <clears throat> the existing kubernetes architecture to to solve all the problem that we experience currently with edge computing so it's 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 a you know it's a fantastic option for us to explore okay so what are the considerations what are, what are things we need to put into consideration while we are trying to adapt the existing Kubernetes architecture for you know, edge computing. You have to know that we have a limited resource at the edge. Okay? So if you're processing you know, terabytes of data in the cloud, you know, you, you know, we have this um, concept of um, infinite storage in the cloud. Okay? That's, we can't have that option at the edge. Okay? We are limited in storage capacity at the edge. Okay? Uh, we need to take care of that. Do we need, what, what was the um, design decision for that? Do we need to move the whole cluster to the edge? Do we need to just put the work handle at the edge? We're going to talk about all those scenarios, how those scenarios play, play out in, you know, in the architecture in the next coming slide, okay? So complicated you know, network condition. You know, we have you know, private network, some, you know, some firm are very, very, you know, very, very particular about their data, you know, and there's a limited bandwidth too. And latency, those are things we need to put into you know, consideration. Uh, the need for autonomy at the edge, I can't emphasize that enough. So we can you know, disconnect from the central location and at the same time still be able to process this data at the edge. Okay, so how do we do handover? Eviction and migration of application when it's disconnected. So when you, <clears throat> by the time you do all the processing at the edge and you, you eventually connect to the, you know, to the central location. How does that end off? How does it happen? How do you upload data back? How do you get the updates? How do you make that synchronization work? You have to consider that. Then device management. Like I said, we have you know, a myriad, you know, uh, number of um, devices from different providers. How do you do device management? If you bring a Huawei phone now, an iPhone, how do you, you know, and they are on the same IoT application. How do you, you know, communicate with these two in an effective manner? How do you have that, you know, uh, device plugin between those two? And the requirement could be, you know, could be varied. How do you standardize that? Next slide, please. Right. So um, we, I will briefly talk about the standard Kubernetes architecture, and this is what we have currently existing in cloud. Okay. In the cloud, we have this master and worker node. Now, the master is like the control plane, okay? It has some things like the scheduler, um, the, the API server, uh, the, the Kubernetes controller, and the ETCD, okay? Uh, briefly, the scheduler helps you to schedule, you know, pods in the worker node. Uh, the controller has things like replication controller, <coughs> node controller, um, service endpoint controller, all those just to, you know, manage the, 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 the deployment on the worker node. And everything is managed, orchestrated by the APS server. So nothing happens within the Kubernetes architecture without the knowledge of your API server. API server, you know, link everything together, does all the management. And like, so your ETC is like your key value data store. It stores all the information of your, of your worker node uh, at every point in time. And I help you keep that backup whenever you need to restore your, your worker node or restore the whole Kubernetes system in general. So, but at the worker node, there's something called kubelet. Kubelet is like a daemon set. So a daemon set means it runs on each node, okay? What it does is to help you, you know, it does all the management of the node, okay? Uh, everything that happened within the node, you know, talks about the, the resource quota, everything. Kubelet, you know, uh, takes that information and talk to the API server, okay? And the API server now do talk to all other control uh, plain components. So that's the brief, you know, um, um, knowledge about, you know, Kubernetes architecture. That's not why we are today, but we are trying to look, so how can we adapt this to help solve the edge computing problem, okay? So originally, so this, uh, Kubernetes was designed for large public cloud, okay? That's the original design, okay? So the question now arises, can we actually adapt this as is? to solve IoT and edge application issues, okay? Now, we need to start asking ourselves that question. Mm -hmm. 
how many control planes do you have? Do we, do we now start you know, replicating these control planes like the thousands or based on number of devices? Uh, can we do this in an aut autonomous way? Okay. Um, and the operation are sites with limited resources. How do we undo all these things? Okay. So that brings us to you know uh, a variance of this architecture that is currently existing and how people are actually. This is a very very recent research. The, it's an ongoing research. It's still ongoing. We have different working groups which I'm part of. Uh, you know, we deliberate every two weeks on how to you know solve this e issue. So next slide, please. So first option, this option one was you know having this whole cluster at the edge. Okay, meaning take all the old Kubernetes deployments currently as is and move them to the edge. Hmm. How does that sound? So meaning everything, you know, uh, that Kubernetes does today, we move everything to the edge. So meaning we, we fork what's currently existing in Kubernetes, we remove some unneeded features and alter some components to reduce resource demand. Okay, that's the whole idea here. Hmm. It's interesting, but there are a lot of uh, disadvantage to this because how many of these deployments will you now have? Okay, how do you do the management between different edge? How do you control API on edge one to talk to API seven on edge one to talk to API seven on edge two? Is very cumbersome. Okay, there are some providers going with this option. Okay, and the the whole reason is they want each each edge node to be autonomous. Hmm? Each edge node is autonomous, but edge to edge communication is a bit tricky here. Okay. Um, next slide. So, option two. Some you know providers are looking at options of having a centralized Kubernetes control plane, and this is like having a central location, central cloud sort of environment, then we have edge with the worker node, okay? And on the centralized location, we have something called a, a, a virtual kubelet, okay? So this virtual kubelet is moved, uh, kubelet normally uh, exists at the worker node, but we move them away and move them into the central uh, Kubernetes uh, um, location, which is in the cloud, okay? So the virtual Kubelets implement this supervisory control. So it's more like a supervisory control over all the edge workload. Okay. So, and this could be containerized. It could be, you know, non Linux OS and could probably have no OS. I'm going to show you how you do all the device management to talk to that virtual kubelet. And this is the implementation of Azure, Microsoft. Microsoft is going with this implementation by saying, okay, uh, move that, you know, kubelets to uh, to the central location, and that's a virtual kubelet, and that virtual kubelet does a supervisory control over all the edge um, devices. That's a, you know that's a good one, and you know you have by so doing you can have you know thousands and hundreds of those edge nodes, and you know you just create that virtual uh, kubelet to to do the control downstream. It's very fantastic. Azure IoT is actually using this implementation. Next. Right, so this is the one I want to, you know, talk more on because uh, it's it's similar to the previous one, but uh, we are not using the idea of virtual kubelet here, but we are actually implementing this edge edge node as in we are we are going deep down to implement edge node um, using the Kubernetes um, uh, custom resource definition. So uh, so the edge runs this containerized workload using kubelet. Okay, which is in for, it's not virtual kubelet, it's just the kubelet we currently use within the Kubernetes environment. It's the fork version. When you hear fork, meaning you you know you do a pull, a pull request for this um, for, 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 for this API, then you do some manipulation or you do some you remove some component, you add some components, and that's all for fork. Then you made it like you you make it lightweight. So lightweight meaning you you strip some components out that is not necessary. Then you had some features to it, and that's what we've done here. Okay, so edge devices, you know, autonomous covering of, you know, it covers that uh, network disconnect and reconnect scenario, which is the autonomous, you know, uh, local autonomous description I, I, I mentioned initially. And the good thing here is we are using protocols like MQTT, Zigbee, 
all these protocols that are for low latency. Okay, uh, it it helps for bidirectional communication between that cloud op and the edge op. Okay, and it's 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 very very fast. It's a very fast protocol. MQTT protocol is what we use in that in that communication uh, link between that cloud and the edge uh, application. So you can see the architecture here. We have a, a data store which is local. Um, so you do all the, you store the local data in the data store for processing. Okay. And we have a device twins that mirror what is actually uh, what you have in your device and your device model, and you do device management using that device twin. Okay, and you have your uh, meta manager. A meta manager links both your you know takes data and pull to your data store based on you know um, different ports or volume requirements. Okay, then we have this broker MTT um, MQTT broker. It's called Mosquito. Mosquito is one of the message broker we can use. To link your application, your IoT application to your edge, um, your edge devices or edge location, um, here a CRD that you uh, you uh, you laid on it. So it's it's very simple, sim very 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 similar to what we currently have in um, in um, in standard Kubernetes, but it's just a lightweight um, kubelet implementation. Next, so. Currently, we have uh, a use case. Um, it's an open source project. It's called Cube Edge. So the Cube Edge uses that uh, lightweight Kubelet implementation that I've described initially. So it's built on you know standard Kubernetes. It's hundred percent compatible with the Kubernetes API, which is currently existing, and it's optimized uh, node components to run you know on the edge. It's bidirectional multiplexing message system. Um, and I told you the protocol is you sometimes use UDIC. UDIC is this quick um, protocol that uses UDP, but it's it's, it's similar to MQTT. MQTT is um, TCP, which is probably preferable. Um, metadata persistence at you know at the edge and local autonomy. Uh, it supports extensive edge application and protocol. This is going to be the you know the standard going forward. To be honest, because um, there's a lot of uh, research work going into this uh, from um, various corporations. There are a lot of um, buying into this option, and that's why I'm probably going to uh, emphasize more on this option next. So yeah, this is this is the architecture of Kubernetes. It's similar to uh, what we've seen initially, but this is the standard architecture that um, Kubernetes is using. You can see um, we use um, a web socket, which is um, for li low latency communication from your cloud call to your edge call. Okay, and the other autonomy is QUIC, which is, is quick, is, is, it was implemented by Google. Um, sometimes it uses the people, you know, um, the, the preferred option is WebSocket because of its low latency bi-directional communication. And um, the same architecture with what we have currently existing in Kubernetes, uh, it's just yeah, we are moving that kind back to the, to the edge. And, you know, we can, you, there's, some, there's an idea of edge match, which is an ingress controller to your, to your edge for, that's another topic for another day. It involves a lot of you know um, jargons there. Then we have uh, your your containerized storage, um, storage interface to provision uh, persistent volume uh, at your at your pods. So we can actually do all all those fancy things we can do within Kubernetes. We can still do it here. Okay, and we have your CNI, which is uh, uh, for your networking and the likes within within your uh, edge 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 device. And um, you can see the mosquito there. Does uh is like your bro is your broker is a message broker that uses MQTT protocol. Uh, does um pops up publish and subscribe uh message uh, model to your edge call, and that does uh takes the mosquito which is the message broker do uh, does um pops up pulls it to the mapper and you know distributes to the device as 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 need be based on you know communication link that has been established. Next. So yeah, I'll just probably quickly describe what, what we have here. At the cube edge, at the cloud side, okay, these are the components. So we have a provision, something called edge controller and the device controller. And uh, similar to the admission controller, we have admission webhook, which does the you know, verification or le legitimacy, legitimacy verification 
So who has a right to talk to what there, okay? And the CSI driver for storage provisioning. Um, for your device controller, it involves a lot of things. I'm going to talk about that later. For your edge controller, I just talk about it. You just, you know, communicate to the edge and does all the management and, you know, provisioning of your of your edge devices, okay? And uh, take note, don't forget, the communication between your, your cloud orb and your edge node is via web socket. If you don't use HTTP here, uh, because a web, web socket is, is, is better for, uh, for low latency communication because we want, we want to achieve that low latency at the edge. So we, we opt out for web socket communication here. Okay? Next. So at the edge, what do you have at the edge? So you come down at the edge, we, we have your edge up, uh, which helps for which does messaging, um, then we have your uh, meta manager for local persistent uh, metadata control. Uh, we have your HD, which is like a cubelet light, you know, um, daemon that runs on that on that edge. That is lightweight, uh, does you know pod lifecycle destroy and you provision the pod within that edge. Okay, we have an, a, you know a device twins. Uh, we have you know event boss for your M MQTT client. And we have, your, you know, there's some services that, you know, HTTP dependent. So we have a, a service bus for that, that takes care of that, okay? Or for communication between your event bus has to use MQTT, okay? All right, um, next. Right, this is probably the, be the last slide. So edge device management, so how do we, this is quite interesting because uh, regardless of the device, where right, right the provider, uh, we the, the, there's an API that actually talks to uh, to the device that actually do the provisioning of the device and you know get the device model and do the uh, custom resource definition um, for all these devices. So we have uh, you have to manage all the plugins using your uh, Kube kubectl or client um, definition. From there, you can talk to the API. From the API, you can actually get um, all the updates from the device. If you want to see the status of your device, if you want to, you know, do some deployment or you want to control um, workload at the device. So it's quite interesting um, feature. I would have, you know, showed a demo here, but I heard that a rice, Raspberry Pi uh, hardware that has, has not arrived yet. I would have shown you how how to talk to, you know, an edge device and you know get data from there and process the data at the end. But yeah, it's a very, very interesting concept. And I, I, I encourage everyone on call to you know, read more on this, get more you know, knowledge around where, where things are moving towards in the nearest future. And most, most cloud provider, they're adapting all these design into their model. They're creating products out of this uh, to help um, users you know, um, get reap the benefits of, of, of edge computing. Uh, I think that should be the last slide. Right. Yeah. All okay. right. <laughs> super, 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 super good. Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Mike and Dr. B. Uh, wow, that was quite insightful. There's be, there's a lot, lot of questions. Okay, uh, for you gentlemen. Um, what I'm going to do in the next few minutes um, is I am just going to um, read all of those questions back, and and we can. Um, you know, we, we, you guys can just help, you know, uh, with the answers. Okay. So if you still have questions, please, by all means, um, you know, put it in the chat box and um, I can take them in no particular order. I um, will just read them out, you know, um, then uh, Dr. Mike and Dr. B can um, help to uh, demystify those questions and provide the right answers, hopefully. All right. Um, just whilst I also have you here as well, um, and again, thank you for joining the section. Um, next week, um, about the same time, um, um, at exactly 11 a.m., I have another um, um, partner of ours uh, who is also into IoT. Uh, but this aspect of IoT that he is into is non-technical. So it's more around business, all right? Um, how you can 
you know, um, use IoT to transform your business. All right. So if you're non-technical, somebody was asking the earlier, oh, this is too much for me. <laughs> I'm not sure if I'll be able to do it. I sense that what's you know, going on in their mind. All right. But if you want to learn IoT from business viewpoint, uh, then the next masterclass uh, that is happening um, on the 8th all right, of, um, of August, which is next week, Saturday at 11 a.m., all right, um, is for you. And it's for everybody, all right, because, um, again, I'm bringing on another expert uh, who is non-technical um, in the field of IoT, but you understand the business um, side of it. It's a masterclass, and it is absolute, absolutely free, all right? Um, so what you would do for us is, some of you registered uh, with us, which is fine. We can send you the link. Um, if you did not, all right, um, you will need to reach us, go to our website. Um, there is an email there um, called info at smartlearninguk.com. I mean, if you're interested, all right, um, um, send us an email um, so that um, we can collate all of um, those email addresses and we can send you uh, the meeting invite. Um, th that this gentleman has a lot of experience. Myself and Mike, Dr. Mike, I've had the opportunity to meet with him. Uh, in, not meet with him physically, uh, but we have had the opportunity to speak to him over the phone. And um, um, when it comes to the business side of IoT, he's quite clued on in that area. And you know, I would like you to come for that masterclass. It's going to be about 40 minutes or maybe an hour. All right. So let's go to uh, the question. Uh, just also to let you know, those people, those that just join us, uh, the section is being recorded. Uh, the recording is going to be available on our YouTube channel. How do you get there? Uh, just go to YouTube and type Smart Learning UK, all in one word, and um, you would be able to um, um, get access to all of our materials. All right, all of our recording, not all of our materials, but our recording. But whilst I also have your attention as well, um, you know, you've learned a lot today. Um, Mike and B, uh, the uh, senior tutors um, for smart learning. Um, if, you know, you want to learn Kubernetes from practical viewpoint, all right, and you want to learn IoT, and for, for some of you, you think, oh yeah, this is good for me. I want to have a blend of both worlds. All right, um, we have a combined um, training pack that would help you. So you will learn the fundamentals of IoT. You will learn, you know, the data analytic part of it. Mike will show you, you know, the architectural part of it as well. Then, all right, and, uh, and I can be, uh, will now, you know, put the icing on the cake uh, with, you know, containerized solution, you know, especially around Kubernetes. So what is not able to show us today, perhaps in the actual training itself, um, he would be able to provide all of those information. If you're interested, you know where to reach us, give us a shout and we'll be able to um, help you out. All right, so let's quickly go through um, the questions. So a lot of questions has been coming in. Um, so someone said, he said, where does distributed hedge, all right, um, distributed hedge technology meets internet of things? So I, 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 I suspect that this question is around all right, where is the overlap? All right, are, are they connected together? Um, so Dr. Mike, do you quickly want to help with that? Okay, so, so like I said, okay, so I, okay, I was just looking at the question. So, so Ledger, so he used Ledger, so I is think- Is it Ledger? I think he wanted yeah. to say so, Edge. I think, so, so I think, no, I think he's probably going around blockchain. Blockchain, I, oh, okay, yeah, all right. Yeah. So if I take it from there, so with the distributed Ledger, it's the same um, technology that you have most of your cryptocurrencies that run on. And with that technology, you have blocks, blocks of information that are created, and these blocks are distributed. And then when you have a block created, it becomes really difficult for you to just um, uh, forge data into that because the data is distributed. And once there's any discrepancy around the block, of course, that node is dropped. And then if you want to add, of course, you can't even delete the block. So once it's created, it's created. And then when you add to it, you just keep adding information to update the previous information, not that you destroy the block. Now, with the data I said that is being created, of course, you can have that integrated to some kind of uh, distributed ledger, depending on what you want to do. So again, it depends on the use case. So there are use cases where uh, maybe trust might be an issue and you want to be able to deploy such a solution with IoT uh, in a, and then you are dealing with people that uh, trust, like I said, can be a big issue. Then you can have a distributed ledger that houses certain information. It could be 
um, it depends on the implementation. I've seen cases where we kind of thinking through having subsets of data of the, uh, the data subject housed within some distributed ledger through a blockchain and then both parties have that maybe like a smart contract and that information is stored. And then, so if I want my information, I can then clearly see maybe through that information, what kind of data have I been created over time? And when I want to request it, then there's some kind of transaction or a block that I can check and say, hey, okay, these are the information I've created over time. Then the manufacturer or whoever has been processing my information can then put that. I'm not speaking in terms of GDPR and some of those. So yes, there's place for you to have all of these in, in, um, technologies integrated. The question would be, what are you trying to do? And that's why if you notice in the talk, I was talking about strategy. So don't just think about it from the perspective of, oh, this exists, so I need to deploy it. No, think about it. What's the question I'm trying to answer? What are my research questions? What is my business challenge? From the business challenge, you need to have a strategy. From the strategy, that strategy will pinpoint certain key aspects, the deployment, the technology, the resources, the stakeholders, uh, what's the best solution. Cost, from even from a cost perspective, would this suffice? Would, this, would, this, would I be able to achieve what I want to achieve? So I'm guessing that's what the person was trying to ask. I hope All that right, I thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, because of our time, um, let's quickly go to the next one. Um, so someone asked here, he said, is Kubelets, um a rule engine or, or IDL? IDL is interface definition language. And I think that's, that question is for you, B. Right, so, right, so Kubelet is, is, you know, it's just um, it's one of the API components in Kubernetes that runs on your, on your worker node. And what it does is to um, take care of the node in terms of node management and the likes. So it takes all the instructions from your API server and does all the deployments in your worker node, okay? It's not, you can't, you can't say it's a rule engine system or, you know, it's, no, no, no. So it's, it's more of, a, it's an API, okay? There are a set of rules in there that actually does all the, you know, configuration, all the um, linkage between two nodes. So if you want to talk between two nodes, you still orchestrate that using the queue proxy. But, you know, uh, I will, I let's see that as, as an API where you build rule into it. So, but those rules, a uh, 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 set of instructions from your API server. Should that answer your question? But you can read more on Kubelet um, on you know your Kubernetes website, and it's quite uh, it's quite informative because uh, it runs on all the nodes as like a demo set. So you once you have a node uh, provisioned, a Kubelet um, is automatically provisioned for that to manage that node. Okay. You, okay. All right. Thank you, um, Dr. B. Um, let's quickly go to the next one. Um, so someone said here, how can a non-literate IT individual learn these things? Uh, where does he start? I can quickly answer those, that actually. All right. Um, it's important for you to know that there is nothing difficult to learn or impossible to learn. Let me put it that word. I, use, I take the word difficult, but impossible to learn. All right. I understand where you're coming from, uh, whether, all right, this might just be like a mirage is too much for me you know where do i start um if you are interested all right um and i say i use the word interested i mean this this appealed to you and you just want to learn it and i think maybe you have overcome maybe 50 percent of the challenge because you are interested um, it does not take away you know the hard work all right um so it means that you just have to now start to um take trainings all right, um, that would help you. You can start with the fundamentals um, of IoT, then gradually just build yourself into um, the aspect of IoT that is more difficult. So you can start with fundamentals of IoT. You could do IoT with data visualization. Um, you could move into IoT data analytic. Um, you know, and we have able hands here, likes of Mike that will teach you um, even the data analytic aspect of it and the architectural 
um, aspect of it as well. If you want to learn it, if you want to combine it with cyber security, um, like, you know, you all know that you cannot take cyber or security out of any of this technology uh, because, you know, there's constant, you know, um, like they've shown us today that, you know, there's an aspect of it where data has been collected all the time. Um, he was even telling us about the aspect of GDPR as well, where you'd be able to remove uh, personal identifiable um, information from data collected. You see earlier on where Mike was showing us those individual writing bike on the on the bridge and also people hanging around the bridge you know these are people and these are images so again privacy is, is very very important so you have to understand regulation and how that also effect you know um, would have an effect on what um, on, on the IoT and the data that you are collecting so um, I mean to cut the long story short that you have to start from the men fundamentals if you have the desire to learn this you can do it but start from the fundamentals and gradually just build your way up um, into um, you know the difficult um, aspect um, of it. There, are, there, there's no shortcut. You just have to work hard. If I put it that way, but it is you can learn it. All right. Um, so that question has been answered. Uh, this next question is um, for you. I think maybe for you, Mike or Doctor B. Someone says, "How do you um, do analytic on the edge? How do you do analytic on the edge?" How do you do analytic on the edge? So I'm sure B might want to comment, but before he does, let me just say this. So again, it boils down to what you're trying to do. Okay. All right. What data do I need to answer the problem I'm trying to answer? So I have a business challenge. Then I have maybe data collected from the sensors. Would I want the data to be uh, processed at the edge and then results of that process then sent to the central location like we said with edge or do we want the data created at the edge and transferred through a mechanism to where we will process the information we can do that we can also do one of the new things now with that google brought out is called federated learning with federated learning is more or less like what i just talked about with the edge where the processing is done at the edge the analytic is done at the edge so you create a model you create a machine learning model, deploy the model to run at the edge. That way, with the data inputs, your features are then housed there, and then it can process on the source and yield results. Or we stream the data in, into a central location, and then there we can then do our analytics. So it just depends on which method you would want to use. And, uh, but in either case, you would um, first obviously understand what challenge you are trying to address. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mike. Uh, Dr. B, do you want quickly want to comment on that? Dr. B? All right, okay. Um, yeah, let's, let's, do you want to comment on that before we move to the next question? Yes, of course. I was All right, then. All right, then. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, that's, a, that's an interesting one, but, but there, there are certain limitations on, on the hedge, like, like I described initially, and that's the resource limitation. So at the hedge, we have uh, these 10 megabytes, uh, 10 MB limitation of data that we can actually process per time. So that could actually be an impediment on how much data you can process at the edge for now. But I think there are a lot of research going on on how to you know, increase its capacity and do uh, better hands off between the edge uh, and, and the central location. But yeah, of course, uh, I'll just add to what Mike has said, uh, what, the source of data, the amount of data, what exactly do you want to get from the data? Those things are quite important, but just the limitation you have to be aware of is that amount of data you can actually have stored in, in the local data store you have at the hedge. All right, thank you, um, Dr. B. Um, the next question here, I'm just conscious of time, uh, but just be patient with us uh, because um, questions are very good because you will just learn from it. Um, someone asked this question, I think it's from Kennedy. He says, IBM Cloud appears to explore central Kubernetes. Okay, so this is for Dr. B. Um, appear to um, explore central Kubernetes control plan. How do you implement security at the broker um, gateway? All right, how do you... Um, implement security at the broker. Yeah, gateway. thank you. Thanks for that question. Uh, as you all know, security is um, is fundamental to all this technology. Uh, there's no way you can um, successfully implement or deploy this technology without taking security um, very very important. So yeah, um, how do you develop secure IoT application? So IoT in general, 
uh, as the streets here uh, deployment. So we have these device or gateways here, which is the one you're asking. Uh, we have the network and transport here, and we have the applications here. Okay. So to actually, uh, there are a lot of you know uh, protocols, a lot of standards to uh, to mitigate any kind of attack or um, security vulnerability at all these tiers. But let me just go straight to the, the device and gateway tier that you mentioned. There are a lot of things like authentication that you can do authentication, uh, and that's why you, that's why you see things like device man, device management there. Now actually does uh, that authentication, and we have these um, web hook um, admission controller at the uh, at the cloud site that actually does the verification of the person that is actually trying to access the application. Is this a person? Does it have the you know the privilege or the, the, is it allowed to actually use the application? That's application. You can actually have a message payload encryption too. You can actually encrypt your payload uh, for secure communication between those two endpoints. We can you know create um, this certificate provisioning and verification uh, model. Uh, you know you have the concept of CSR within your Kubernetes. Uh, no one wants to go into that, but you can actually do all those uh, certificate verification there. Then we are, you can actually use secure MQTT uh, or transport layer to, uh, you know, MQTT, like I said, is a, is, a, is, a, is a lightweight protocol that helps to achieve this, uh, this secure communication um, using the this push uh, and pull model. That's a publish and subscribe model within, within your system. You can actually do a secure um, implementation of that. You can add, have firewalls, you can add firewalls to that. You can have firmware, you can always have firmware updates and, and patches of this hardware. There are a lot of things you can do. And these are just the, the few ones that I've highlighted here. Thank you. All right, thank you, um, Dr. B, um, for that. That's why in, in, very, very good as well and insightful. So um, another gentleman asked a question here. He says, how, do, um, how will IoT device overcome the issue um, of um, zero day attack. And I think you, you Dr. B, you already covered it um, earlier on. Um, as you all are aware, um, the zero day attack um, is an attack that actually exploits um, a potential um, um, uh, software flaw or you know, a weakness um, that a vendor or a developer may, 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 may have in their product that they are not aware of. And Dr. B mentioned something earlier on that you know, your firmware update is very, very important. Among other things uh, that you, you need to do um, to protect um, your device or to protect the software, the firmware um, within that device, um, you also have to carry out constant security um, testing or assurance um, against the product, i.e. vulnerability management scan, you know, um, regular penetration testing, but more importantly, um, the firmware update um, is key, all right? Um, some manufacturers, what they do is, uh, once they have a product developed, maybe an IoT product, a sensor, uh, they take it, you know, um, to Bonte Hauntons, you know, um, to try to break the product. Um, you know, to just test how rigid, all right, um, the controls that are built in into it, um, uh, um, uh, to test how strong those controls are. But um, one thing that they also have to constantly do um, is the firmware um, update, among other security controls uh, that you can put in place. All right, so thank you. I hope that answers your question. Um, the next one here um, is uh, with the number of um, IoT devices um, joining the internet daily. Um, how are the manufacturers um, um, managing compliance rules or regulations, or maybe ensuring that those products um, meet certain regulatory um, compliance? You know, so um, I would, you know, I would let Dr. Mike or Dr. B to come in here, but let me just quickly comment. I think this question is just more around. So maybe this this uh, this person is asking this question around various jurisdictions, um, as you know that you know um, UK, for example, we, well the entire Europe. Uh, maybe for a few places are, uh, you know, being governed by various regulation and among them is GDPR, among others, all right? And um, for, you know, if you're in Africa, um, a lot of, you know, um, nations in Africa are also adopting the GDPR as well, you know? So for example, in Nigeria, uh, we have the NDPR, which is the Ni uh, Nigerian Data Protection. And I understand that in Utopia, in Ghana, you know, um, a lot of them are just adopting. In fact, there's this new regulation in Brazil as well, you know, and they are all offshoot um, of the GDPR. So I sense that the, I suspect that this question um, here is more around 
all right, if you're using an IoT product, maybe a sensor um, in UK or you're using it in Brazil, or you're using it, how do you ensure, how would manufacturer ensure um, that um, the, their product meets regulatory compliance in that particular you know, jurisdiction or location? Um, over to you, uh, Dr. Mike. So thank you, Ali. Uh, so one other thing I'll add with that is um, standards is still a big monster. The reason for that is with this um, IoT or in the IoT space, people are innovating. I mean, remember earlier B mentioned that he ordered a Raspberry Pi, for instance, and he's trying, he's doing some things with that. I, for instance, for instance, I have an Arduino board at home. I have a Raspberry Pi, so I'm conducting and doing some building some systems. So. There are lots of opportunities for people to explore these things, and it's it's in a, it's in its infancy in the sense that there's a lot of um, space for people to still have those standards regulated in some way. Would they follow adhere to this one or that one? So there's still a lot of room in that. Like Wale is saying, it's it's still there's still a build up even for in a compliance perspective. However, one of the things I would say is. As an individual of one organization, you need to think through what kind of security measures you build around the IoT. So when we're looking at um, critical infrastructure, and you're talking about blending IoT with industrial control systems, for example, the industrial control systems are considered critical infrastructure, which means when they can impact, when there's an, a breach or uh, an attack, it affects the entire nation, the country, people might die. You can imagine turning off the lights in during winter. You see what I mean? So it, it will affect a lot of people, the economy. So when you are not injecting some of these IoT devices and to be able to create um, new forms of um, analytics to be able to do certain processes you know, make the business operate better, you have to use things what we call like the defense in-depth approach that allows us to apply controls in segments and layers. So you segment the entire infrastructure, you have the architecture, identify those things, introduce firewalls, intrusion detection systems, intrusion prevention systems, and you have clusters and segments of them. So think about it like an onion. Those as assets, break them down into different onions. So layer them. How much, what kind of controls do I need to put around this asset? An asset with anything, obviously, that is valuable to the organization. So it might be those IoT devices, depending on where it's used and how it's used. So you build all those layers of controls around them. Um, and then, obviously, you would be satisfying some of those um, regulatory conditions like GDPR that Wally talked about. Thank all you. Right. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's also, you mentioned something here which was quite interesting as well. And I quickly just want to relate it to the question um, somebody asked about, about oh, um, can a non-literate IT individual learn, you know, internet of things? And, you know, so the world of internet of things, which is also imagined as well, is massive, all right? So um, if you've been listening to um, Dr. Mike earlier on when he was talking about standard regulation, I mean, these are areas that has not even been, you know, um, 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 uh, explored yet, all all right, um, because there's just so much you know you could do within the space. So I think the point I'm trying to make there is, if see, if you find IT complex, um, maybe you feel a little bit old, and you can't go back to school and start to uh, understand what TCP/IP is and understand what OSI model is. You know, to worry. All right, there's something that, there's something for you within the IoT. What about regulation? What about, what about standard? I mean, you, you can influence standard. You know, you, you could, you know, you, once you understand this concept and you look at, you know, the existing standard that we have, which I trust me, um, it does not even cover the entire IoT. So we have the ISO, for example. I'm not sure if ISO already have something around, and, and around IoT. So you, you can start to position yourself, all right, um, in that area, all right, without um, necessarily being um, all that um, technical, all right? So there's something um, for everyone within the space um, of IoT. Someone asked this question, and this is probably for Dr. Mike or uh, Dr. B, he said, how can IoT help in agricultural um, def development? Dr. Mike, you can go first, then uh, maybe Dr. B will just, you know, um, add some bits and pieces there, all right? Okay, so i give an example um, with an organization. It's an Israeli company, an Israeli IoT company. And what they developed was an IoT device that is placed on the tail of a cow. It's placed on the tail of the cow that based on how the, tail, how the cow flaps its tail, it's able to predict to the closest one hour when the cow is about to give birth. It notifies the farmer and the farmer then comes to assist the cow 
during its delivery process. That is just one application. So there are so many ways. There are sensors that can check soil content, soil type. Maybe if you are, you are um, maybe uh, removing the moisture content in a particular uh, or patch, you can also check the moisture content. You have sensors to check moisture content. There are so many sensors to do different things. So once you have an understanding of the business process, there's absolutely a wide variety of sensors that you can then begin to pick from that you can use to automate some of those processes to get data that can then help the farmer inform the next thing he would need to do to improve the yield, improve the supply chain, uh, and improve his own product productivity. I hope that helps. All right, thank you. Um, we've just a few more questions, and you know we'll be we'll, we'll close um, maybe in the next um, five uh, seven minutes. Yeah, please. Um, if you quickly um, add to that, please. So there are, there are a couple of application uh, of IoT in, in agriculture. Uh, I think one 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 um, that's that you know sparks my mind now is monitoring of um, you know climate conditions. A couple of um, you know uh, IoT devices that can actually help to. Uh, to monitor where that changes, and that actually can, you know, give the farmer some in, insightful decision on the kind of crop to plant at some point, and data are collected, processed at the hedge, even, you know, moved back and forth from the cloud to, to the farmer's phone, like an alert or something. So it's, it's quite, uh, it's revolutionizing that field currently, and there's also greenhouse uh, automation. I heard about uh, a firm using that to uh, to automate their deployment of uh, these greenhouse um, device, devices, and it's called, it's called smart green hub, sort of. So it's 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 it's, it's a manual intervention to actually control greenhouse environment by the farmers. All right, thank you um, for that, um, Dr. B. A um, few more questions, gentlemen, and um, I do apologize. I'm sure every one of us are, we are enjoying this. All right, um, so a few more questions. Someone asked this question. I think this is for maybe Dr. Mike or Dr. B. Um, all right, this one is for Dr. B. It says, how does um, container-oriented um, technology uh, relates to component-based driven technology? I'm not sure, do you, do you understand that question? How does container-oriented technology, um, how does it relate to component-based driven technology? Component-based component -based driven. driven that's, yeah. that's interesting. Component-based, okay. okay. Um, if, if I can interpret that to my understanding, so uh, um, uh, Kubernetes, like uh, like you all know, is 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 a, is a different modules of APIs, you know, just talking to each other. That 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 that's the whole idea of Kubernetes. Okay, we have different, you know, uh, components of the uh, of the control plane, different components of the worker node, and all are just APIs, basically, just you know, communicating to each other and doing stuff. So. In contrast to a component base, I would say these things are also, you know, they are components. They just, you know, uh, designed in such a way that they are, you know, they are abstracted from the, the complexity of the operation is abstracted from the end user. And all you just see is, you know, you manage them using uh, a client, a client binary, which is a kubectl to send command to these API servers, and they actually, you know, does that communication and does the you know, API calls to each other, and you know. It's very, very interesting. So it's, it's probably, uh, I would say probably it's the same, you know, idea of having those components, having communication independently to each other. All right. Thank you. Um, I hope that has been answered. Then the next question says, uh, what role does soft sensing um, play in IoT? What role does soft sensing play in IoT? I'm not right. sure that question. You don't, you, okay, yeah. um, soft sensing. It says I'm soft sensing. Let's clarify. Uh, let's, let's go back to, all right, whilst we wait for that, let's quickly look at this question. Um, so this one, also, how is the agent, um, so this person, I suspect like they were asking about um, agent. They wanted to know how um, agent is um, implemented within a device. Um, are the business rule driven? Are these business rule driven or data object specific or are they data object specific rules? Please, can you provide um, clarification? So I think this is on the back of um, some of the things you mentioned, uh, Dr. Mike, um, about maybe sensor datas. Um, so they wanted to know 
um, how um, whether you know it is agent driven, and if it is, um, are these agent installed um, on the device? Um, and if that is also the case as well, um, are their business rule are they business rule driven, uh, or are they data um, object uh, specific rules? I hope that do you answer that question. I think it ties more to some of the explanation that they already mentioned about the architecture. Okay. About how you can um, actually create certain business logics that can be pushed and how it's processed. Is it from the central location or is it from the edge? Uh, and based on his um, description, I'm, <laughs> B, I'm sure you would want to dive in, but before you jump, jump in, yeah, I'll, just say, I'll just say one thing is, with the business logic, again, boils down to what the organization is trying to achieve. It then becomes what's the best way of achieving our purpose? What's the best architecture from a cost perspective, from a resource perspective? What's the best way of doing this? Do we push this here? Do we, do we process it here? B, you can continue. Yeah, from, from the architectural standpoint, you've, you've actually you know, started uh, to talk around that. So you, the lot of consideration when it comes to uh, design options and what, what exactly, so the, 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 the starting point usually is what, what is the business definition? What exactly are you trying to achieve? What is the business goal? What is driving this? So from there, you can now start drilling down into uh, the best architecture, the best design that actually meets those goals, uh, taking into consideration those key factors like cost, reliability, performance, scalability, and all other non-functional requirements that are actually in place within the organization to checkmate those goals. So, um, like I said, uh, you can have those business rules at the edge, fantastic, but you are limited, you're always limited for now on, on, those, uh, uh, on those resource limitations that I've actually mentioned initially. So, yeah, you, you can have those, uh, those, those talk around that and um, you, can, you can make your business, uh, you can take your business to the next level using all these concepts that we described here. All right, then, and this is the last um, question. Uh, this is more, of, you know, this is general, um, quite general question to be honest. Someone is asking, uh, and I think this is for from Kennedy or Carrefour. Um, says, do we have IoT data center in Nigeria, um, Dr. Mike? Would you know? Uh, not specifically. I know there are a few data centers that uh, I think is what's it called? Is it uh, there's one in Lagos that I heard about, but I don't okay. think specifically for IoT. It's a okay. data center, and I know they house a lot of data there's also the one galaxy backbone i think i don't know um is it called galaxy backbone i think owned by the government mm -hmm. there's one owned by the government placed in nigeria in abuja um mm -hmm. the the one in lagos i think it's uh I've forgotten your name now. Just, main one main one thank you mm -hmm. main one i i don't know uh, what specifics but clearly they already is it if it's a data center then clearly they offer service, such services and uh, to what extent and what's their service like or what their infrastructure are, I don't really know. Yeah, to add to, add to that, there are a couple of firms, you know, um, diving into a tier four data center provisioning within like, in Nigeria currently. I'm, I'm actually working closely with one called 21st Century. So they've deployed, uh, I think, five data centers already in, uh, in Lagos, and they're actually doing stuff behind the scene, uh, just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, we, are, we are actually working around the clock to help, um, you know, data proliferation in Nigeria and get, you know, get people talking about using data and listening data and, you know, give that, you know, infrastructure base for companies to strive in Nigeria. So 24th century is one of them that is uh, actually making waves too. All right. Okay. So um, that answers that question um, anyway, but this individual has now started talking about, I mean, the person that asked the question says, oh, if not, why depend on a third party cloud domain? I'm worried about the post-COVID-19 um, um, digital colonization, if we can have our own um, cloud um, data center. Like, you know, so Dr. B has already answered that question. So there's a whole lot that's going on um, behind the scene, you know, um, you know, with the example that you gave the 24th century data center. Um, I, I believe that answers that question. Um, then someone says uh, there's also Rack Center in Lagos. Uh, da, 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 da. All right. So, guys, um, thank you so much, um, uh, Dr. B and Dr. Mike. It's always a pleasure. Um, you know, to have both of you. Um, I'm too sure that everyone on this call today, uh, they have learned something. Um, and if, you're, if you join us um, 
maybe late. Uh, the recording of this um, um, section um, is on our YouTube. It's going to be on our YouTube channel. I'm going to post it um, tomorrow. Um, just go to YouTube and search for Smart Learning um, UK, all right, all in one word, and um, it will take you to uh, where the recordings uh, would be loaded. Okay, so and you can, you know, um, avail yourself the opportunity to listen to it again. If you're interested um, in learning um, containerized solution like Kubernetes um, or, you know, anything that we've said here today, kind of, you know, tickle your fancy and um, you wanted to, you know, go into it or learn it, then um, you have come to the right place. You can see that these individuals, uh, they're not just only coming from the academic background, but they, you know, uh, they have touched the things that their hands you know have done it you know so their bag of experience and these are the people uh, that you want to learn from you don't want to go to where um, somebody's just going to be telling you what they have read in a book all right um, in as much as that is good but the practical experience you won't get it and Mike and B um, they, they come from those um, both side of the world uh, where you can learn and also um, if you are in a business and you think you know we can help you um, how to, you know, consult them for you, um, help you to design a solution. You can see everything that Dr. Mike was talking about earlier and Dr. B was around concept and, you know, designing solutions. Um, yeah, um, um, we can uh, definitely help in that area as well. Um, if you work in an organization in manufacturing, for example, somebody asks the question around, you know, can IoT be used in agriculture? So if you're a farmer or you own a big farm and you think, yes, you know, um, you know I think IoT can help me, yeah, then by all means, give us a shout. Uh, we'll be more than happy um, to help you to look into what you have and design um, a solution um, for you that is fit for purpose and that would also help you to improve your business. Uh, just also lastly, um, next week we're going to be having, you know, a master class. So if you want to learn how to turn IoT to money, all right, I use that word. <laughs> um, if you just don't know, you know, so some, some of you are just thinking, oh, this thing is too complex. I just want money, all right? So if that's you, uh, you want to learn how to turn IoT to money, all right, um, then be um, in that class next week. Um, I have another guest uh, who is also seasoned IoT um, 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 specialist, but not from the technical um, side, all right? It's just, um, this, this guy is just all about money, all right? Um, it's not all about technical things. And if that, again, uh, you're interested, just give us a shout. Uh, send us, send an email. Um, can someone post our email there? Um, you can reach us. Uh, I mean, you can give me a call. Our telephone number is there. Um, I don't want to assume that you are interested in it, but um, but if you are, then you have to reach us on that email, admin at smartlearninguk.com or info um, at smart learning. Um, and it is absolutely free. Okay. You can invite your friends. Um, I'm going to be sharing uh, again. You can follow us on LinkedIn. Uh, follow me on LinkedIn. Um, my name is Wale Omolere. Um, on LinkedIn, you'll see me there. Um, because the event, just as we posted this event, all right, I'm going to be posting that event as well um, on our LinkedIn page. Um, and you can also follow Smart Learning as well um, for updates. Sometimes it can be very difficult to keep uh, track um, um, of emails, but on LinkedIn, I'm quite active there. I'm going to post the event and I'm going to send, share the uh, meeting invite um, to you. All right. Um, like I said, we go a lot around Kubernetes. If that is your thing, then by all means, um, reach out to us because we have a combo. All right. A combo is a combination of IoT and Kubernetes only together, you know, um, and that will come as a trading pack if you are interested. All right. So again, to my able speakers, um, Dr. Mike and Dr. B, thank you so much um, for sharing your knowledge. You shared it for free, but you know what? God will richly uh, reward you. All right. So without any, further, any, without any other questions, I think we can bring this to a close. Thank you guys. And um, see you next week, Saturday. And bye.